Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Magic Arena gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at another historic deck and we've got a pretty sweet one in store. A deck called The Great Unsealing featuring none other than Sarkon's Unsealing, a sweet 4 man enchantment that didn't get a ton of love during its time in Standard. But now in Historic we've got a ton of new tools to make it worth it. So it's an enchantment that says whenever we cast a creature spell with power 4, 5 or 6, Sarkon's Unsealing deals 4 damage to any target. And whenever we cast a creature spell with power 7 or greater, the Unsealing deals 4 damage to each opponent and each creature and planeswalker they control. So a very devastating effect whenever we can cast a very large creature, especially at power 7 or greater. And of course, a Rotting Registrar pairs quite well with Sarkon's Unsealing, since just for 3 mana we get to trigger the second mode on the Unsealing, dealing 4 damage to everything they own. So that's a very powerful combination. And another card that ties into this deck nicely is the Great Henge from Throne of Eldraine. Costs X mana less to cast, where X is the greatest power among creatures we control. So only costing double green when we have a Rotting Register in play, and then taps to add double green and gains two life. And whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we can put a plus one plus one counter on it and draw a card. So it makes for a nice card draw engine as well. So the Great Henge and the Unsealing are kind of our two value engines in this deck. And then the rest of the deck is mostly just big creatures that can help us trigger the unsealing and make it nice and cheap to play out our great henge. So let's take a look at the list. At one mana of course we've got the full playset of ladder elves to speed things up. One mana for a 1-1 one -one that taps to add green mana, so nice accelerant for the deck. As well as the full playset of paradise druid as another ramp creature that can also help us fix our mana. We also have the full four copies of bond of flourishing which is quite versatile in this deck as it helps us find every single card in the deck except for other copies of bond of flourishing so it can find or Great Henge and or Sarkons and Sealing if we already have the big creatures, or can help us find the large creatures if we already have our value engines, and every now and then can also just find a land if we need a third land drop. So very versatile card, also gains a bit of life, and we don't have a ton of stuff going on in the early turns, so it's a, a nice way to kind of set up our future turns in this deck. Then at 3 mana is where all the big creatures start appearing, we've got our full playset of Rotting Register of course, 3 mana for a 7-6 does have a drawback of having to discard a card at the beginning of our upkeep, but that's usually negligible given how many powerful things we can do with it. And then we also have 4 copies of a Bone Crusher Giant, which we can often cast for 2 mana first using the Adventure Stomp, dealing 2 damage to any target. And then afterwards we can cast a 3 mana 4-3 with Upside, which will still trigger Sarkon's Unsealing first ability and make it cheaper to play our Great Henge. And then we also have 4 copies of Lovestruck Beast, which can first make a 1-1 one -one Human Token with the Adventure Heart's Desire. And then afterwards we get to make a 3 mana 5-5 five -five that can't attack unless we control a 1-1 one -one creature, which of course plays well with the 1-1 one -one token we make, as well as our Lanner Elves, so we've got a bit of redundancy there as well. And then we also have two copies of Kiora Behemoth Beckoner, which is a 3 mana 7 loyalty planeswalker that says, whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under our control, we get to draw a card. It's another great card draw engine in the deck, and every single one of our payoff creatures has power 4 or greater, including Bone Crusher Giant. And then the minus one also lets us untap target permanent, so sometimes we can just float mana with one of our lands, untap a land, and it essentially ramps us for one. Can also untap our creatures to essentially give them vigilance. We can even untap a great henge to make two additional mana, so there's a lot of neat synergies with uh, Cure's minus one as well, but for the most part just a powerful card or engine alongside the great henge. And then at four mana, of course, we've got a playset of Sarkons and Sealing, as well as two copies of Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma, which is essentially another payoff card for playing all these large creatures as a legendary bear that's a 4-3 saying creature spells we cast with power 4 or greater cost 2 generic mana less to cast so we can play a 1 mana rotting register with goreclaw in play which is quite powerful and as if that weren't enough whenever goreclaw attacks each creature we control with power 4 or greater gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains a trample until end of turn so that includes goreclaw itself but also all our other creatures so quite a combo with rotting register as we now have an 8 power trampling creature so no chum blocking allowed so Registrar is the bestest of buddies with Goreclaw for sure. And then at the uh, top of our curve, of course, we've got our four copies of the Great Henge, which we can often cast for very little
bottle, and then last but certainly not least, two copies of Galta Primal Hunger, which fits perfectly into this deck as a 12 mana, 12 12 legendary elder dinosaur with trample that costs X mana less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures we control. So, unlike the Great Henge, which only looks at the greatest power among creatures we control, Galta looks at the total power of creatures we control, so we can often just cast it for double green if we have somewhat of a board presence, and then a 12 12 will even trigger the second mode on Sarkons and Ceiling, much like Rotting Regisaur. So a great finisher for the deck, could potentially play more than two copies, we're kind of playing it conservatively here with just two, because of course without that uh, first large creature in play, Galta doesn't do much, but uh, the same can be said for a lot of the cards in this deck. And then looking at the mana base, only 22 lands, because we don't actually need a ton of mana for this deck to function, we just need to get up to four to maybe play on ceiling, but we also have eight mana creatures and for Bond of Flourishing to find more lands, so we can get away with a lower land count. So we've got three forests alongside four overgrown tombs and four stomping ground to give us a total of 11 untapped green sources, which is usually the bare minimum for a Lunar Elves deck. And then to round out our shock lands, four copies of Blood Crypt as well, and then a couple of check lands in three copies of Woodland Cemetery, and four copies of Rootbound Crag. So that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play, and yeah, this seems like a keeper to me. Question here is whether we want to play a turn two Regisaur, or whether we want to maybe find red mana with Bond of Flourishing first, and play on Ceiling first. So we get that nice uh, board sweeping effect with a Regisaur. Interesting. Well, I could just go Regisaur into Regisaur. Opponent on red-white here, so maybe on a feather deck, maybe some sort of control deck. Hard to say. I think I'll play it slow and just go for the Bond of Flourishing and try and set up our Unsealing first. Kiora is also tempting, Goreclaw is also strong. But I think I want the red mana here. And then we'll play the Stapped. I think saving ourselves 2 damage on the off chance we're up against an aggro deck probably outweighs potentially getting in 1 damage with our Elf. Alright, opponent's got a Kiln Fiend, so maybe they are some sort of red, white, feather, Kiln Fiend's uh, deck. And yeah, Kiln Fiend is a scary card, can potentially kill us next turn for all we know. But uh, I think we're playing on Ceiling and then we can use Regisaur to deal with the Kiln Fiend afterwards. And at 23, they would need to do something pretty special to actually kill us. Alright, Gideon, that's fine. Unsealing also damages Planeswalkers. So we can play Regisaur, deal 4 to Gideon, and then use the Lunar Elves to finish it off. That seems good to me. And then I don't even know if we need to play out this extra Woodland Cemetery or if I just discard it to the Regisaur. I guess I can discard the Bond of Flourishing instead. Alright, there's Feather. Maybe with a God's Willing as protection. But they'll need to name Red to save Feather in the first place. And then they're still gonna have to deal with the Rotting Regisaur afterwards. So I guess it doesn't hurt to Bond of Flourishing first. And Bone Crusher is fine. So I could also just cast a Bone Crusher to deal 4, but that doesn't seem necessary when we can play another Regisaur. And then... What makes more sense? I guess playing Regisaur first. So they have a Sheltering Light instead, alright. I guess that's a lot better than God's Willing here. Actually makes it indestructible, so they could even chum block Regisaur. So here I'll put a stop on my upkeep so I can cast the Adventure of Bone Crusher, And then I guess I might as well play the lands, since we'll have to discard two cards to the Regisaur. A Legionnaire, that's fine. And Arcanists. So in response to these triggers, we'll just stomp the Legionnaire. And then we can cast the Bone Crusher to clean up Feather. And then, uh, ooh, even a Great Henge too. Man, we're just going off here.
And yeah, my opponent has seen enough. Well, that was quite a draw. Also seeing the synergy there between uh, the Adventure on Bonecrusher Giant and Rotting Registrar, being able to still use the two-man adventure first without having to just discard or bone crusher is quite nice. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw, and this hand is a bit light on mana. No mana creatures, but we do have some decent tools otherwise between the bone crusher, the lobster beast, double unsealing and a great henge. And we're on the draw, so if I draw a third land or one of our mana creatures we're in decent shape. The rest can take an unsealing or a great hench. Takes a great hench. All right, I guess we'll uh, make a one-one. All right, Paradise Druids. Back up great hench. Yeah, I guess it's probably worth taking to over keeping up Stomp. So that if they do tap the Paradise Root, we get to kill it right away. Yeah, a lot of elves. Fine stomping that as well. I could hold my creatures to be able to play on ceiling first, but given that I have two of them, I think I'm fine playing out one of them. And which one makes more sense? Of course, the Lobster Beast hits a bit harder, but it might be more easy for my opponent to strand the Lobster Beast unable to attack if they can uh, deal with a 1 1 token. Yeah, I'd probably still go for the Lobster Beast here, just because it makes our Great Hench one cheaper, which could matter. So we could potentially play the next turn. Alright, Assassin's Trophy, my beasts. Fair enough. Bond of Flourishing's not bad, but uh, I don't mind playing an Unsealing here. And we'll get in for one. That way, if they do attack with the Paradise Root, we can kill it when playing Bone Crusher. Even though we're trading one damage for two damage, potentially. Yeah, opponent's still happy doing nothing. So, how greedy do we get? Do we play another Unsealing first? Could Bonds find a land, still play Unsealing? Or Bonds? And then still play Bone Crusher. Yeah, maybe find a Rotting Register as well, which would be quite strong. Just a couple of lands. We'll take one that doesn't cost me any life to play untapped. And then again, hit for one, and I guess play on ceiling. And then each of these Bone Crusher Giants is basically eight damage to my opponent's face, so I can just burn them out next turn. Freebooter can take my Great Hench, but can't take my Bone Crusher. And yeah, looks like they're toast here. And Sarkons and Ceiling is on cast, so even against uh, counter spells, it still resolves, which is pretty nice. And there we go, just double unsealing for the win. On to the next one. All right, we're on the play with uh, an acceptable hand for sure. Turn two, Paradise Roots. Turn three, we could play Registrar to set up our Great Henge. Facing potentially Monorets. Still feeling like a Paradise Roots okay. I could also bond to find a land instead. But if I miss on a land, that's pretty bad. Yeah. If we're up against Monorats, they're gonna have a hard time killing my Regisaur. 
this early in the game. And if we get to untap and slam a great hench against the reds, we should be in great shape. I guess we might be missing double green if they kill my paradise druid. Alright, points on blue, red instead. Shimmer of possibility, so maybe this is a Fires of Invention deck. Well, I guess uh, I'm just slamming a Registaur here. And hopefully we can untap with Paradise Druids. And Registaur is still in play. Another Shimmer, that's fine. Could still have a Shock to kill my Druids. What to discard? Probably the Bond at this point. Play Great Henge. I can even use my Stomping Ground for it. And then I guess we'll adventure Lobstruck Beasts and cast it. Alright, perfect. Their opponent is facing lethal next turn if they don't interact with the board. They might have a Fires of Invention here. If they can kill the 1-1, the Lovestruck Beast can't attack, so that's also maybe a way for them to stay alive. It's gonna be Lava Coil plus maybe a Lightning Strike, alright? It's not too bad. Now we don't have to discard. And hello, Galta. So... Yeah, I guess we'll... Play Bone Crusher and then play Galta. Seems good to me. Attack with all. And we can always stomp if we have to. Flame sweep to kill the small stuff. And an opts. I don't think that's gonna cut it, and my opponent explodes. Alright, sweet. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play, and what about this hand? We're missing any of our payoffs, but we have a bond to maybe find it. I've got OK mana, Bone Crusher to maybe interact on turn 2 if needed. So it's probably keepable. But it does hinge on the bond finding us something good, like an unsealing or a great hench for the sand to really shine. And then probably okay to take two so we can adventure the Lovestruck Beast. But we could regret it if we're up against an aggressive deck, because we're going to end up uh, shocking ourselves quite a bit if we want to curve out. Turn one islands. Alright, so maybe some sort of mono blue. Curious Obsession type of deck. Eh, let's uh, attack for one. And then I'm probably just casting Bond of Flourishing. They could have a Spectral Sailor that they want to flash in here. But uh, I think I'm priced into casting Bonds instead of keeping up two mana for a Stomp. Could be Spell Pierced, so be it. Alright, they're gonna spell pierce the bond. So next turn we're probably just playing a Lobstruck Beast. They could potentially bounce our 1-1 one -one token somehow, but then we've got another Heart's Desire waiting in the wings. Now I do gotta watch out for Murfolk Trickster. Also I do have Bone Crusher, so if they Trickster I could just stomp the Trickster, but then I don't get to play my Beasts, but I guess I can make another 1-1. One -one. So it's probably still worth it to attack here, given the stomp. So let's see if they have a Trickster. Just a Sailor. That one I'm okay trading with. And then I'm probably still just casting my Beast here. And then next turn we can make a 1 1 so the Beast can attack. So they must have another one mana spell here, another sailor.
There's a curious obsession. Hopefully they don't have a way to protect from stomp. The play next turn is going to be to stomp and to heart's desire. But plenty of two mana counters my opponent could have. Dive down also works and storm tamer now as well. Alright, so they're going to have a spectral sailor drawing them an extra card per turn. We gotta somehow try and outrace that with our Galtas and Lobster Beasts, which is definitely possible. Do I even bother stomping? They're just gonna sack the Storm Tamer. And Stomp doesn't get around this ability now, does it? This says damage can be prevented, but this counters it. So yeah, if that's the case, I might be better off just adventuring the beast and playing the beasts. And attacking for five. And then next turn we can slam Galta. Now if they can somehow deal with the 1-1 token, that definitely sets back our offense here. Tempest Jin. Alright, so we can play Galta. I can stomp. So I guess we start by attacking. Stomp the Sailor anyway. Do that first in case of Spell Pierce. Not that I would pay for Spell Pierce because I want to play Galta here, but. Uh, and then my opponent will need something like Trickster to manage the Galta, as well as an answer to the 1-1 token. Which is definitely possible. Hopefully they don't. Right. They do go for the Storm Tamer. Alright, we're at 11, only expecting to take 7 or 8 damage. And then we've got a nice 12-12 Trampling Galta to try and close out the game. But yeah, Murfolk Trickster could potentially keep them in it, but they don't have it. Alright, I guess they could have tried to attack maybe to draw it, but maybe they're just not playing Murfolk Trickster, which is also entirely possible. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play. Don't think I can keep this hand. It's definitely close to keepable since we do have Beast times 2 to speed up Galta, but we're probably not casting the Unsealing in time, no black for Regisaur. Would rather take a mulligan. And this one we can keep. Pretty decent looking hands. Just missing a mana creature to maybe speed things up. But uh, I've got double unsealing, probably only gonna keep one of them. And then register to trigger it, so looks good to me. And then turn two, we could either stomp or bond the flourishing here. Depending on whether or not they play a mana elf worth killing. And yeah, that one definitely counts. Now I might play the Unsealing before playing the Regisaur if we think we're gonna need the 4 damage effects. Another mana dork. A nice new animation on the Gilded Goose is pretty funny. Yeah, I might uh, play it slow here. So we can bond first and then play an Elf. Looking for a Great Henge. Lobster Beasts would also be decent here. Still gonna prioritize the Lunar Elves so we can actually play the Unsealing next turn. So opponent maybe Mono Green, maybe Blue Green. Looks Mono Green so far. So yeah, the 4 damage from Unsealing might not be enough to kill every single creature in their deck. Their own Bond of Flourishing, alright. So they might also be playing the Great Henge. Just finds a forest for now. Alright, so we'll play Unsealing and we'll Adventure the Beasts. So we've got multiple ways of triggering the first mode on Unsealing and then one in hand to trigger the second mode as well. 
Can maybe combine them to take out something bigger. Alright. Nissa doesn't really scare me. Which is not something you get to say very often. So finding a land here would actually be ideal. That way we get to play Registrar plus another creature. Perfect. So we'll start with the old Reggie. Dealing four to everything. But I guess these two could have also finished off Nissa regardless. But I would still prefer to play the beast here, I think. And hit for one. So yeah, missing on a land would not have been a disaster, as we could have still cleaned up Nyssa. Don't have to discard anything, since we're empty-handed. Goreclaw's great. I guess we'll get the Ranger out of the way, since it could chum block Regisaur. And then we could play one mana Bone Crusher, although the Auto Tapper actually tapped all my reds, which I didn't notice. So I wouldn't have been able to play Bone Crusher the way it tapped our mana. So I guess that's a, a good uh, thing to keep in mind when playing Goreclaw. It doesn't take into account the mana discounts when it, the Goreclaw resolves. So you gotta double check how the game taps your mana to make sure you can still play other big creatures for one mana afterwards. But uh, yeah, my opponent was in trouble there, facing quite a board with uh, Unsealing in play. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw. This hand is awkward because our green source doesn't come into play untapped. So that makes these Lander Elves a lot less appealing. So I think I'm okay taking a mulligan because of that. Alright, I guess this is keepable. Uh, what to put on the bottom? Maybe one Loftruck Beasts. And that way we get to keep both our payoffs, Sinkiora and Unsealing, Bond to find a third land. Or I could just get rid of the Unsealing and then just try and ride Cura plus double Beast to victory, which is also reasonable. And then we have a backup Beast in case they deal with the 1-1 token. Yeah, maybe that's the more reasonable take. Alright, so this could be an Opt or a Shock. Let's find out. Opt it is. So hopefully we can find black mana with the Bond of Flourishing. Oh, Arcanus, so my opponent maybe on a blue-red wizard uh, aggro deck here. Alright. Did find a black mana in the meantime. And I guess we'll take a painless black source in the cemetery. So... Probably still leaning towards playing Kyura first, although Atlas represents a lot of damage. Great combo with the Arcanist here. So we're taking five. So I might not have time to play Kyura first. And now that we drew a Great Hand, we have an extra reason to play Regisaur right away here. So I think I can get away with uh, playing Regisaur. And then maybe I can sneak Kira into play once we have Great Henge in play, since Kira basically pays for herself if she untaps the Great Henge. Ooh. They've got two burn spells to kill Regisaur. Shard, of course, yeah. So now the Arcanist has three power, which is enough to get back. The Wizard's Lining from the Graveyard, thanks to Odalis, which is enough to kill Regisaur. So yeah, great start from our opponents. Great synergy between Arcanist and Odalis. And we might just be too far behind at this point. So, what are my options? If I play a Beasts, my Great Henge will still cost 4 mana, so I can't play it this turn. But I guess that's the best I can do. Or I could go Kyora, 
but then I need to pay two life in order to still play Beast afterwards. And every life point matters when facing all these evasive wizards. So it's probably better to just uh, play my lands tapped and just play the Beast here. And I guess I'll offer the trade for my token. Since the Storm Tamer is probably not blocking anyway. And then I guess I could need more red mana. Alright, so we could easily be dead. Shard course. So if they have another cheap spell here, we're dead. Shock should do it. As Arcanus gets to trigger Atlas once more. So yeah, this game did not go according to plan. We had a reasonable draw too. But Arcanus plus Atlas, quite a combo. The card we needed in this game was something like a Bone Crusher Giant getting to stomp Atlas to kind of slow them down a little bit. But uh, yeah, on to the next one. All right, we're on the draw with a beautiful looking hand. I guess we don't quite get to play Lanarolf's turn one, but the plan is probably still to play on ceiling before playing all these creatures. So it's not that big of a deal. All right, Regisaur, so sadly don't get to play turn two Regisaur. Probably still benefits me to play a green source in case we draw an untapped green source and I go Lanarolf's plus Adventure the Beasts. And then I guess Rootbound is fine in case we need to stomp. All right, nothing for three mana. So I'm not expecting my Lanarolf's to survive here, but still gonna run it out there. All right, it's not dead yet, so that's good. Hopefully next turn we get to play Unsealing. And once we have an Unsealing in play, these Regisaurs are quite a bit better than what the uh, card text says. Yeah, I uh, don't mind playing a Reggie here. And then we can also adventure the Lovestruck Beasts. And I'm probably still okay running out an extra land. Alright, looks like... Uh, I guess my opponent wanted to see the Gilded Goose animation. Alright, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw. And yeah, I mean... This seems keepable enough. We've got our turn one elf, turn two bond maybe, even if the elf dies to dig for a third land. And we've got our unsealing. Missing black mana, but no registers in hand, so it's not too bad. No shocks. Definitely gotta watch out for cards like Goblin Chain Warler when playing all these one toughness creatures. Alright, Monoret so far, Amber Hauler. So it could also be Goblin Tribal. So Chain Warlord is definitely pretty uh, important to play around if possible. Which means I'm probably not playing Paradise Druid and instead just playing Bond of Flourishing to find my land drops and then probably just playing Stomping Ground Tapped or I guess Overgrown Tomb Tapped. Although how irrelevant is a black mana in this hand? I mean, it could definitely matter if we draw a Register at some point, but it's also two extra life I might have to pay, which is important against a, a red aggro deck. So I think I still take Overgrown Tomb, but it's definitely possible that taking the Rootbound Crag is correct there. Suppose I could have also played Stomping Ground Tapped on the off chance that I need to Stomp and then just play my other land Tapped for the turn. Now what? Probably just play my Unsealing. Or I could stomp the Warboss. How much does that extra token matter? I mean, they also get to attack a Mentor. So yeah, not playing something around last turn means that if I did want to stomp here, 
I would not be using my turn optimally, considering I want to probably still play around Chain Whirler. But let's have some fun and just jam this on ceiling. And hopefully we won't regret it. And then the unsealing can catch us back up. Especially if we do find a register of the top. Alright, so they are definitely on goblins. Let's see what the matron gets. Usually gets ringleader, but you never know. Alright, it's gonna be a war chief. Also makes sense. Ooh, wow, that's the perfect top deck here. Well, we definitely didn't get punished for our greedy play. And what do we discard? Probably Paradise Road at this point. <laughs> nice. So... I was going to go Goreclaw into another one of our 3-drops, but now I can play Galta instead, which is probably better. And I don't have enough mana for Goreclaw into Galta. But I do have enough mana for Lovestruck Beast into Galta, so we'll do that. Go face, because Galta is going to deal with the War Chief. And that puts my opponent to 1. Don't know if there was a way to actually kill them here. It's possible there was. But I'm not too concerned. There's a ringleader. And we'll discard Gorklaw, I guess. And smash face. And Galta gets across the finish line, trampling over the tiny goblins. Alright, sweet. So, yeah, the deck is definitely capable of some very explosive starts. It mostly hinges on Rotting Regisaur to give you those broken starts, but uh, Bone Crusher Giant and Lobster Beasts are pretty good backup plans as well. So overall, we're playing good cards, and our cards also have great synergy together, so that usually makes for a pretty good deck. So that's going to be it for me today. I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.